Welcome to our L Monitor Pro webinar on whether the U.S. should worry about China in the Gulf. I'm Andrew Parasoliti, president of L Monitor, and our guest today is Dr. Karen Young, senior research scholar at Columbia University Center on Global Energy Policy and author of The Economic Statecraft of the Gulf Arab States, as well as L Monitor and L Monitor Pro columns and articles. For those of you who are participating and not pro members, you can get a free membership via the code which has been sent to you. And therefore you can check out Karen's superb memo on this topic of China's strategy in the Gulf and other memos on the business, economic and technology trends in the region that we cover on pro. For our viewers, please submit your questions via the Q&A function on Zoom. Karen, welcome. Great to have you with us. Thank you, Andrew. It's great to be with you. Let's get started. You write in your pro memo this week that China is China's hosting of a diplomatic breakthrough in the planned resumption of diplomatic ties and embassy operations between Iran and Saudi Arabia signals a different kind of Chinese interest and willingness to engage in the politics of the Persian Gulf. But China's presence in the Gulf remains largely of an economic nature, you write, with a concern for its energy supply. How big a political and diplomatic role is China willing to play in the Gulf? Well, I think that's, you know, obviously the big question. This is sort of new, um, new activity, and uh, I think it's a little bit experimental. Uh, of course, you know, I think we have to give credit to, uh, you know, kind of longstanding negotiations between the Iranians and the Saudis hosted in Iraq, which had more to do with that actual meeting and, um, and agreement. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's not a peace deal. It's not um, anything of a kind of ramping up of economic ties, you know, on either side of the Gulf right now, but it is a little bit more of evidence of a Chinese footprint. Um, and I think that's what has been so surprising. So China has not really taken much of a, of a political interest in, in the region and certainly not in wanting to get between rivals Saudi and Iran. Um, so this speaks to, I think, a, somewhat of a new ambition perhaps, um, but I still see very much the Chinese presence as an economic one um, and not one as a, as a security provider in any way in the region. Karen, what does the leadership of Saudi Arabia and the UAE expect from engagement from China, with China? I mean, how, how do those capitals see it? And how concerned should they be about being forced to take sides if the U.S. keeps ramping up sanctions and pressure on China? Well, I mean, this is where I think we need a little bit of a, of a reframing, a little bit of a, a broadening of the way we think about um, Gulf-China relationships now in the, in the context in which this is happening. So we're seeing, you know, this sort of schism or what some people are calling more of a, um, a non-aligned uh, kind of uh, majority among developing economies and how they sense this anxiety over growing conflict between two great superpowers, the United States and China, and where does that leave them? Um, and so I think for the Gulf states, this is really about models of economic development. Of course, it's about their very important export market in China for their energy products uh, and wanting to be responsive to that customer. Um, it is a customer service priority for Gulf leadership to, to be responsive to Chinese demands, to um, be welcoming to Chinese leadership to sign you know, um, economic cooperation agreements, that is in their interest to do so. But this exists within a larger schism. Um, and I think we have to reflect also upon you know, what's going on in terms of US domestic politics, how our own leadership is parsing this, um, this challenge, which is at once a, a challenge for economic development at home in new American industrial policy, which um, Jake Sullivan laid out very clearly last week in an address. Um, and this, you know, raises a lot of question marks for emerging economies broadly, um, but especially for the Gulf states. So China starts to look more relatable. Um, and certainly when we see these kind of clubs happening, the democracy club versus the non-democracy club, 
these longstanding ties between the U.S. and the Gulf are 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 frayed by them because it's a it's an uh, you know a problem of belonging and where do you sit and you know where do you um, uh, kind of choose in terms of your organization of state and economy and and the privileges that you see um, in uh, you know in the kind of trade relationships industrial policy that um, that states are making um, so it's a it's a much bigger kind of question in terms of geoeconomics. Um, and the Gulf states are more and more seeing their own model as more similar to that of China's um, and less similar to that of what we see happening in US domestic politics. Let me dig down a little on, on that very topic and, and that answer. What are the trends you see in Chinese investment in the region? And getting into a theme of your, your really outstanding book, which I would recommend to, to all of our viewers, is China therefore a rival or a partner to the Gulf states or, or both depending on the context? So there's tremendous synergy now happening um, between China and the Gulf states in um, what we think of as, as, um, as energy markets, right? So of course China is, an, is right now a very large consumer of oil and gas. Um, but that is that will change, right? So demographically, China is changing. Um, we expect that oil dem demand in China will start to plateau and decline over the next 10, 20 years. So that's something for Gulf states to keep in mind. Um, but they're investing together in lots of different kinds of projects. So, um, you know, exciting announcements that came out this week. Um, China has agreed to invest in a steel facility or Bao Steel, which is a Chinese company. Um, in Saudi Arabia, but not within, you know, any of the kind of mega projects. This is within um, a special economic zone. And so it comes with certain, um, you know, kind of freebies for the, the operating firm. So it means that they pay a lower corporate tax rate. It means that they have um, different restrictions on um, requirements for hiring locals um, than you would in a, in a normal uh, jurisdiction. And so that's a synergy. It helps in terms of Saudi Arabia's need for foreign direct investment. And China has then a need for, you know, building the things that it's interested in. So whether that's steel production with very low cost and cleaner energy source, it's going to be a gas fired um, operation, but can move towards hydrogen fired in the future. Um, so that's, you know, very attractive. We also see a synergy in terms of the construction of uh, refinery facilities inside of China, partnerships between the Chinese oil company Sinopec and Aramco. Um, and this is something that's of interest to Saudi Arabia because you wanna be where your customer is so you can export crude oil and then be part of the refinery process um, and the sale of that refined product inside of China, that's a plus. Um, so these are examples of where it's fruitful and, um, and I think synergistic, right? But there are also cases of where we see competition. Um, and I think this is really interesting. And the cases that I explore in the book are Oman and Pakistan. Um, the Omani case is really interesting. There has been some um, expectations of significant Chinese investment in Oman. China is Oman's most important export market for crude oil. So the, the relationship there is quite tight. Um, but you know, the way that China has traditionally un, you know, kind of used its development model has been through lending. And so there were some uh, state bank loans to Oman, which have now been partially repaid. Um, and that is not really welcome, I think, you know, on the peninsula, um, because the Gulf states, the other Gulf states, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Qatar, like to be the closer partner, the closer economic, political, and security partner um, in Oman rather than an outsider. So that's a point, I think, of competition. Um, and we see now more clearly Saudi Arabia, the UAE themselves competing for investment opportunities and partnerships inside of Oman. Pakistan also is interesting as a site of competition between Gulf actors and China. Um, they both have different kinds of security priorities in working with Pakistan. Um, for China, this is about the economic corridor through Pakistan um, and its kind of entry points into uh, West Asia. 
Um, for the Gulf states and for Saudi Arabia in particular, Pakistan has long been a security partner in its military. Um, there are you know, plenty of, um, of examples of members of or former members of the Pakistani, Pakistani military coming to Saudi Arabia as advisors. The request, of course, by Saudi Arabia to Pakistan to help provide um, military assistance in Yemen, which was denied. Um, and the longstanding expectation or, or um, uh, hope that Pakistan might be uh, a partner perhaps in advanced military capabilities, including even on the nuclear file um, in the Saudi case. Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Qatar, um, particularly the Saudis have been longstanding development partners in Pakistan, giving soft loans, um, commitments of, uh, of investment, um, and these are similar tools to what the Chinese use, um, but there's a different kind of, I think, um, cultural, religious, and uh, regional relationship to Pakistan, which I think China in some ways could, uh, could threaten, including the, uh, the kind of tripartite relationship between China, Pakistan, and Iran, which is not in Saudi interest. So Karen, digging down even further on this question, so where is the US winning or losing with China in the region? And does China see its role in the Gulf and the Middle East more broadly as a contest for influence with the United States? And is there any way or where could Chinese China get an advantage? Oh, I'm really hesitant to kind of make a scorecard like that, right? I think a lot of this um, this sense of the great competition with China is, is very much an American question and an American preoccupation, not the same as it is felt or perceived inside of the Gulf. And I think that's really important to underscore um, because it, it now colors all of the uh, kind of bilateral relationships between the United States and our Gulf partners and this can, you know, keeps coming up, right? But the Gulf states don't see China the same way that the United States does in terms of a threatening capacity. Um, and, and I don't think they appreciate um, the kind of scorekeeping that uh, the, Uni the United States might start to do um, in terms of these investment flows, but also in terms of a Chinese presence, whether it's in port facilities or um, in the transfer of technologies and, and those uh, potentially for military use. Um, and so this is part of our, you know, part of our challenge right now is this different perception of China's role, both in the region, but as a development actor, as I mentioned. Um, and, and I think, yes, of course, the US is worried. We're worried about China everywhere, not just in the Middle East. But the most important geographic sites of US-China competition are not necessarily in the Middle East. Um, so, you know, it's, it's good to keep that with you know a little bit of of perspective, um, and frankly, the United States is not able to make an argument that um, that China can be put to the side uh, simply based on the way that energy markets are looking, where demand for energy products from the Gulf are, um, and and Gulf states will take care of themselves first and and you know put that trade relationship uh, as a priority. Just a reminder, we are already have a, a list of questions uh, for Dr. Karen Young. If you could submit via the Q&A function on Zoom. Karen, um, you've written probably more than anyone I can think of about both Gulf and Chinese investment and interests in Sudan. You have a chapter in your book about this. How do you assess the consequences of the current Sudan conflict on Beijing and the Gulf particularly the UAE and Saudi Arabia, we see Saudi now be involved in the diplomacy. What are their interests and how do you see that playing out? Well, obviously, um, Sudan is a, is, a, is a difficult case. Um, and I think you can explain a lot of the Gulf intervention, financial intervention in Sudan, simply by the nature of it being such a difficult operating place. Uh, it's not a place where private capital wants to be. A country that has, you know, had been under sanctions, um, had had a you know very you know tenuous relationship with the United States under uh, Bashir, 
Um, and so, the, you know, it's kind of low hanging fruit in terms of an opportunity to, um, to, to financially intervene, to form relationships. Um, after 2019, there were good relationships, of course, with, with Bashir. Um, and, you know, for a little bit of money, you could go a long way. Um, and you could facilitate the um, the the political lives and uh, and economic livelihoods um, of these uh, military actors, whether it's um, Borhan or Hamedti, right? They both were um, advantaged by relationships with the Gulf um, and commitments in central bank deposits, in commitments of foreign direct investment, sustained the project of Sudan after 2019, right? Um, and now that's sort of falling apart, right? And so the question is, um, you know, would more money have made a difference? No, it probably would have just accelerated um, this competition between rival um, military leaders. Um, and in terms of the, you know, the interest of other outsiders, whether it's the United States or China or um, you know, Iran or, or, you know, any other kind of regional actor, um, it's really about, you know, the strategic geography of Sudan and the Red Sea Corridor. And so that's what everybody's interested in, um, in terms of ports, logistics flows, um, and also, of course, energy flows. And, and so that's not going to change, right? So Sudan will be important, um, particularly, you know, looking across the Gulf uh, to the Saudi coastline, um, this is this is going to matter for the region, but also for outside actors. Um, and you know, there's a lot of blame going around right now of you know how could this have been handled differently? Where were um, you know the the Americans and the Europeans um, in terms of intermediaries? But the truth is that everyone sort of accepted and has accepted in other places. Uh, the role of Gulf financial intervention and political uh, leverage. Um, and so I think now we're beginning to see what, what the consequences, what the institutional consequences of that intervention looks like. And you could make the same argument in Ethiopia, in Egypt, um, in Pakistan, in Yemen, um, because there are many places now where the Gulf states have been incredibly important as sources of financial stability and intervention um, with, uh, with support for you know, local political actors. Um, and you know, this goes back to that opening kind of discussion about how do you transfer a model of political economy or visions of economic development, and there are going to be outcomes to that. Um, and so I think this is an area ripe for study. It's something I'm, you know, quite interested in and have been tracking for quite a few years now. But it's it, the game's not over, and uh, and it's a it's a learning curve as well, both for the Gulf states and for other international actors um, in how we can um, partner together and and how in places where we see um, this intervention happening. Um, how the terms can be negotiated perhaps differently. And that's something for the recipient states to be thinking about now as well. Karen, a question uh, from one of our viewers. Uh, at some point, if China is really partially substantially dependent on energy supplies from the Gulf, won't the geopolitics of supply, what the suppliers want, shift toward the geopolitics of demand, what China wants and what it needs to do to protect its interests? Well, the Chinese have um, historically been very, very good at diversifying their sources of uh, energy and meeting their own energy needs. Um, and they continue to do so. And so our current crisis in terms of the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine and the export of Russian crude um, is one good example. Um, China maintains good relationships. They're able to, uh, to import plenty of uh, of Russian crude and get it from other places as well. Um, India is doing the same, right? So, you know, China is not beholden to Gulf exporters in the way that Gulf exporters are beholden to China um, as a purchaser of their products. Um, and don't forget that China is, uh, you know, is an important producer of its own energy needs, right? Um, they, they have oil uh, resources. They also, you know, are building a whole lot of new coal power plants, um, a lot of gas fired plants and solar. And so I think when we, when we look forward in terms of China's energy needs 20 years from now, 
Um, certainly in their transport sector, that is changing. China is selling more electric vehicles than anyone else and building more electric vehicles. They're changing the dimensions of what they need and who they need it from. And so I, I definitely see that relationship um, with Gulf exporters um, in terms of China's reliance on the Gulf as diminishing over time. Karen, you teased the next question. How do you see India's interest in the region? Is, this, uh, is there any similarities or patterns that, that we can follow with regard to what China is already doing? Yeah, and I think for the Gulf, um, you know, these are the big players, right? And now India is, is surpassing China in terms of population growth and um, perhaps in, in its demographic curves looks, looks a little bit different. Um, this is where there will be more demand for all kinds of products, whether it's on the petrochemical side um, or uh, energy demand um, in terms of oil and gas and, um, uh, and new products. So India is ripe for um, these kind of synergistic relationships with the Gulf um, energy or, and, um, you know, the kind of plastics petrochem. Uh, India is probably a harder place to be an investor in some ways than it is in China. Um, and so these the co-investment space or the synergistic um, ways that China operates inside the Gulf, like we talked about the, the steel facility, um, uh, there's a potential Chinese Sinopec investment inside of gas production inside of Saudi Arabia. You don't see that from India um, because of lack of capacity or, or, or just um, not, lack of resources. Um, so that's something that might change um, in the next decade, but uh, energy is certainly going to be an important part of Gulf India relationships. But, you know, there's a lot more than that as well. Um, and so if you think about the, the Indian business community abroad, uh, entertainment community abroad, um, very, very active in the Gulf um, and, and a lot of longstanding ties and relationships there. How do you see uh, the competition between Saudi Arabia and the UAE or investment FDI from China? So the UAE is by far more of a recipient of Chinese foreign direct investment than Saudi Arabia. We've talked a lot about Saudi and, and that Saudi-China relationship gets a lot of attention, but we should probably pay more attention to the China-Emirati relationship because that is where there are more flows happening, um, more over time and more at the moment as well. And it's a little bit different, I think, in terms of the strategies that the Emirates versus uh, Saudi Arabia use in their forward-looking um, co-investments or the way that they're looking to attract Chinese investment. Um, for example, in the UAE, some recent Chinese investment have been in kind of more advanced technologies. So for example, there is a, a project of uh, a Chinese um, um, aerospace company that uh, a drone company that's also into building electric airplanes. That's very friendly to the UAE, of interest to the UAE. They want to be in the aerospace sector. They want to be in renewable transport and you know the difficult, hard to abate sectors, um, including um, airlines. And so you know that's that's a long term sort of commitment. That's. A little bit different than what we see in Saudi Arabia. It's more of the medium term. We think about the trajectory of the energy transition. Um, so more into perhaps LNG, um, into steel, into petrochems, um, into you know traditional contracting, which China is quite good at. Um, but the UAE, we're seeing more into the pharma, high tech um, investments from China, which I think points to um, certainly a longer term um, synergistic relationship there. Karen, as more private Chinese firms enter the GCC countries, do U.S. authorities view them as a threat? As an example, TikTok dominates the Vina market for short videos and live streaming. There's a lot of discussion here in the United States about banning TikTok. Would the U.S. consider sanctioning uh, TikTok or ByteDance, its parent company, as it did Huawei? or others? And do you see this as a kind of front line of, of a potential front line of US-Chinese tension in the region? 
That's a good question. And I don't really know enough to say much about it um, because I don't study US sanctions policy very, uh, very closely. And, um, and I don't know what's going to happen with these specific firms. Um, but yes, of course, it comes up in the bilateral relationship. Of course, it is a worry. And the closening of, you know, any kind of um, investment or uh, especially state to state relationships, whether it's a state investment fund um, in the tech space. And, you know, I mentioned the, you know, drone and, and aerospace is certainly also of interest um, in logistics and port facilities, any kind of potential military presence. And of course, also in what we think of as um, information technology spaces. Um, so, you know, that's uh, that's been an issue in our bilateral relationship with the UAE, with Saudi Arabia, particularly over Huawei for some time now. Um, it's, you know, it's not going to go away. And there's, you know, there's now talk of Huawei, you know, moving its regional headquarters into Saudi Arabia. Um, and so it's going to come up again. Um, and so this is, you know, goes back to that question. Do, can you ask the Gulf states to choose? Well, no. And, and the argument, the counter argument has always been, well, you didn't provide us an alternative. Give us something better. Give us something else. We'll happily, you know, consider it. Um, but the United States has not been able to do that because our economy, frankly, isn't structured that way. We don't have state champion technology firms that we try to push off onto developing economies. That's not how we work. So again, this bigger schism, right? It comes back to this question of what the US is asking developing countries to do and the kinds of alternatives in the financing, in the availability of firms and technologies that we have on offer is simply quite different because we have operated in an open economy, um, which is prioritized and, and loved the idea of trade and operations in, in third countries. Um, and now that's having this screeching pullback um, and so it complicates our foreign policy relationships and, of course, what we think of as, um, as new industrial policy inside the United States. Aaron, time is, is short, but I want to get a few more questions in uh, from our viewers. A uh, question here basically about the U.S.-Saudi relationship. Has, has the relationship moved beyond uh, the the concerns in Riyadh from when then candidate Biden referred to the kingdom as a pariah is that behind the relationship at this point? I do think we have moved on. Um, I do think it's improving. Uh, the bilateral relationship is is on better ground than it was even a year ago last summer with the president's visit. Um, I think there have been some very clear signals, including with the uh, the signing of the um, the agreement for Boeing, um, that you know Saudi Arabia is open for business and U.S. firms are encouraged to to operate there. I think that's the signal the U.S. government is sending, um, and uh, and you know whatever the the kind of difficulties that we've had in the past few years um, are are hoped to be better. Um, but it's still difficult, right? Because of all the things we just talked about, because of the suspicion over relationships with Chinese firms, because of suspicions over um, this kind of you know, growing um, difference among economies that are more managed by their states rather than by their private sectors. Um, that's not gonna go away. So we're gonna have these ups and downs, but I think people have probably also seen, um, there's been a lot of coverage, Bloomberg and. Um, and other outlets lately of, you know, we're going into a recession uh, and U.S. firms, particularly tech firms, are hungry for investment and hungry for capital. And they are realizing that the, you know, most um, amenable places to go are Gulf sovereign funds. Um, and so that the search for capital is changing the perception of doing business in the Gulf from an American standpoint, probably more so than anything that the U.S. government is signaling. Karen, a question about nuclear power. Saudi Arabia has expressed an interest in ramping up its civilian nuclear energy program. How does it fit with its overall energy horizon, including the emphasis on renewables? And how would you assess the UAE experience in nuclear power. I think they, they're working with South Korean companies, if I remember correctly. That's right. 
Um, so these are, you know, two very different kinds of uh, programs by design. Of course, the Emirati program in full operation um, with uh, nuclear energy being produced and the capacity to produce more. They can build as many, they can have as many as eight reactors um, is, is part of the kind of long-term plan. So a surplus actually of electricity um, in the UAE. Um, and so it's also been under what the, we call the, the, the gold standard, um, the 123 agreement in which uh, there is no um, refining or enrichment or even really storage of, um, of fuels in, um, in the UAE. Um, Saudi Arabia wants something different. They have a domestic mining uh, initiative. They do have uranium domestically. It would be quite expensive and probably not very economical to mine and produce uh, and, uh, and refine for electricity generation, um, but they still would like to do it. And there are obviously national security reasons and, and, and military reasons why governments like to have that capacity. Um, so that's the sticking point. There's also the issue that US firms um, have not been very competitive globally in terms of the construction of uh, nuclear power plants. Um, and so, you know, there have been uh, initial tenders in Saudi Arabia for kind of the design phase of, um, of, this, uh, of the power sector. Um, and, uh, and US firms have not been kind of the top players. Um, so we're seeing a lot of interest from French, from South Korean, um, and even from Russian firms there. Um, I think in terms of Saudi Arabia's objectives to generate electricity from non-hydrocarbon sources, the reason to do that, of course, is to save valuable oil and potentially gas for export, um, but also to meet their um, net zero by 2050 target. And you can only do that if you're generating electricity domestically um, from non-carbon sources. Um, and so there are plans to build a whole lot of solar power plants, which are underway, um, but nuclear power will also have to be part of that, um, that equation. Um, so it is, uh, it is definitely both a, you know, you could call it a climate priority, um, though that's a little bit tricky because net zero targets are, don't really <laughs> do anything about what you export and where that's burned. Um, that doesn't count as what you uh, use domestically. So um, yes, I think the, uh, the nuclear um, domestic electricity generation program will go forward. Um, and, you know, it's going to be very interesting to see which firms win these awards and the speed of their, uh, their ability to, uh, to get to production. Um, and the uh, kind of uh, parallel processes of, uh, of Saudi domestic mining and, and industrial programs. Is China a player in the export of, of nuclear power? I know they've been involved. Yes, in I should have said that. Yes. Yeah, the Iranian program, but uh, I don't even know if the Iranians have been satisfied with with China's engagement there. But uh, how do you assess their involvement? Yeah, I mean, China um, is, uh, of course, you know, one of the places in the world where there is, you know, significant nuclear power generation. Um, so they have the the expertise. Um, they tend to do well in tenders because they can underbid competitors um, and they can also provide financing um, for, uh, for these kind of large projects. So that is an advantage for them, for sure. Karen, we are out of time. I just want to thank you for a fantastic conversation today. I learned a lot about China and the Gulf. I encourage all of our viewers uh, if they have not done so, sign up for All Monitor Pro, check out Karen's memo and all the other fantastic analysis we have about business, economic, tech trends, not just in the Gulf, but throughout the region. I'm Andrew Parasoliti, President of All Monitor. Thank you. Please continue to check out our news and analysis at allmonitor.com.